question and proposition that's often been claimed by the IPCC group. I hope you all know what IPCC is, right? Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. These are rather quote unquote powerful group because we are just little people, right? But the problem with them is that <clears throat> every time you ask, especially on those survey about, oh, we don't know how much man-made, how much uh, natural, actually that's quite true. We don't know. And therefore we must try to find out what is the reality, right? But one of the most famous things that they know for sure now, whatever, 99% confident, whatever it is, it's all nonsense, by the way. Those statistics are a pure abuse, to be serious, right? I'm going to address that simple question. They say there's just absolutely no way the sun can affect the climate. That's all. My job is really simple. I set the bar really low. Okay? Don't mind me. Second, go. So we're going to tell you something very exciting. In the sense that uh, I've been kicking around this topic for a very long time. In fact, the Greek has studied this issue for a very long time. If you know about the word uh, season, right? It is actually come from the word uh, related to the angle of the sun, actually, right? It's about studying how the sun affects the climate system. And to start with, it's very obvious, physical sizes, is that the sun is very, very big. The earth is very, very small, right? It's about 110 times smaller. But of course, it's nothing to do with the size. It's about the energetics. The, the earth essentially don't have any ability to give energy to power all the circulations and the ocean movement and all this other stuff, right? All the energy that we got is just mostly from the sun, right? Supplied by the sun. So just imagine, right? The sun don't do anything or change anything and change a little bit. It will have huge impact, okay? That's the part of the hint. Uh, next. So the excitement of my career is basically to be able to work with these two guys. It's a blessing, to be honest. You can call them amateur, you can call them anything you want. These are really the most brilliant scientists I ever met. I have met quite a few good guys, by the way. Uh, so, we started this work in 2015 when we published this paper. The first point I wanted, well, they, by the way, Ronan has the brilliant idea. We all know that there's this surface thermometer record, right? And we're all kind of suspicious that, you know, maybe some of them is not so good, some of them is good, you know. But so, which is which? How are we going to find the, the right way to tackle and ask a simple question? If the temperature has changed, where shall we look, right? Typically, if you look at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study in New York, they will provide you a graph like this. Just focus on the red graph, which is what they call the Northern Hemisphere Thermometer Station, right? Temperature. It looks like it's cold and then it warms in the 30s and 40s and then it cools a little bit and then it shoots up very warm at the end. And I propose to you that the part where I highlighted from 80s and 70s to now, is actually had nothing to do with uh, reality. I propose to you that this has something to do with what we call contamination of the thermometer data. So Ronan and, and uh, Michael has the brilliant idea. Why don't we just do the most simple thing that no, apparently nobody has ever done that, okay? Just think about this. This is 2015. You know, at least 25 years, 30 years after the, the IPCC first report and the famous uh, Reverend Jim Henson, I call him Jeff Reverend because he's not doing any science, Reverend Jim Henson has testified in 1988 in the U.S. Senate or Congress House saying that, you know, we are 99% sure that uh, we have seen the effect and the fingerprint of the carbon dioxide right here, my fingerprint. I couldn't find CO2 right here. <laughs> anyway, move on, next. So, Roland said, why don't we look at all the thermometer data that is in the rural station? Don't look at the station from places like this, Marysville, California where the thermometer measurement is sitting very near uh, some air conditioned unit, engine, and then very near a concrete and very much near the wall and so on and so forth. I mean, shouldn't we not study climate change from places like this? Right? Don't you think so? Next. The second example I want to give is just to contrast a huge mega, uh, mega city like Tokyo, 14 million people, right? Versus a small little island right at the same longitude south of uh, Tokyo. Next. And you can see what the temperature measurement says. The Tokyo line is basically here showing some really systematic warming. And then you can see immediately places like that. So I think the suspicion can be roughly <coughs> justified in the sense that you do not want to use the Tokyo temperature station to study this topic, no matter how clever you think you are. Because the problem of trying to we take out this component that you claim is contaminated. By the way, it's not just pure concrete or urban effects. 
depends also on the time of the data has been taken, it depends on also when, uh, uh, how the, the area surrounding the temperature and record has changed, like more trees have grown and you build some walls and things like that, right? Before it was probably green fuel or things like that, right? So you have to work out all this problem. For the first step, we say, forget about it, just look at stuff in the rural station. That's what we set out to do. Just ask the question, what do we see? You know what? We ask this question honestly, we go and look for it, we don't know the answer. So why invite you to look at it together, right? Next. So these are the places that we have confidence with. USA, Arctic Circle, rural China, and of course, the famous uh, <laughs> island. The great island. No, we have great confidence. These guys went through the detail that is so amazing about what happened to the thermometer station and blah, blah, blah. It's a lot of detective work. So next. So when we take all this region, we average all the data together, look what it got. You got pretty much a curve that is quite not the same as what you saw in the NASA GIS station, right? Okay, in terms of comparing Northern Hemisphere, right? And of course, it looked like this, so I'm not going to make no statement about this, but the whole problem is, you can see, the temperature warm and rich, uh, the highest, uh, rather, uh, rather warm period called the 30s and the 40s, and then cool a little bit substantially, by the way, by about half a degree, and then warm again, but the relative high is not the same as the one before, right? So next, first thing you do is what do you do? Science, you check. Is there a way to check whether these data sets that we found, what we call composite northern hemisphere record, can be checked against, let's say, for here, what, what do we do? It's over the land station, right, the thermometer. So we say, why don't we look at what the sea surface temperature is doing? Okay? You can plot it and scale it in two different ways. And doesn't matter which one you look, but we want to show every possibility that you can see. Not too bad, because the ocean seems to be doing the same thing, right? Rather like this, and then warm a little bit, and go and go up like that. It's sort of reasonable. So that's that's a zero order test. Okay? Yeah. We didn't seek out to find any answer, just to see what it is. So next, the second one is basically some papers that just got published. This is just a random test, by the way. After the publication, we show a different sets of uh, three rings data in our actual paper. And then here is just the same thing. You can see roughly the end of the warming is not that much of a different compared to the middle, the, the, the warm in the 40s and the 30s, right? Next, please. That's the three ring data sets. And then another set that it seems to be available that is good is basically an assimilation. This is not an actual observation, but it's the best of our knowledge to try to account for all the, the heat in the global ocean. And, uh, and this is actually Northern Hemisphere Global Ocean, but for the heat content. And you can see, it actually don't have the bias that is zoom up near the end of it, right? So next. And, and the question now, after you, actually we show a few more in our actual paper, of course, you know, comparing with other available data sets, including glacial length changes. And the, the, the whole thing is actually to ask, what, what could it be caused by? Is there a way to try to explain this, right? After all, science is about trying to find some cause and effect. If you see some observation, this change or not changing, why, right? So it's obvious now I'm trying to propose to you that perhaps the sun has something to do with this. <laughs> to try to understand it, it's very simple. I told you it's about energetics. If you know some numbers, I mean the sun pretty much have about a billion times over power the earth, right? In terms of energetics. Just to give you a contrast, the world's most powerful laser is of the order of still we're catching up to the, what the earth itself can provide in terms of power. But those laser business are just for a tiny region and tiny spot, right? And you pause it in some, some, some short length of uh, time. So next please. So here, the, 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 mom, the temperature record that we showed just now and overlaid now is the best estimate of the solar irradiance, what we call the solar light output from the sun. The best estimate. According to Al Gore, it's kind of fit. <laughs> I mean, do I go out now claim that, hey, I know everything, I'm done. You know, hey, man, I'm so famous, I solve every problem, right? Uh -uh, not so. It's not so simple. You see, that's the problem. It depends on what you want to do in life. You want to joke around, you want to do some cheating and all that. This is not cheating, by the way. They claim that the sun cannot be affecting the climate. Am I right? Yeah. Do we agree with that? Yes. Right? What did I just do? I just show you that it's possible to show this. And we have published this in a peer review paper. I have nothing to do with also showing up. We just published the paper to explain what we find 
what we understand. It's not solving any problem except to say that we need to learn a lot more. Next, please. The reason why we need to learn more is because we don't know exactly how the sun's irradiance changes. I only picked one data set that is shown at the upper panel that is not being selected or completely neglected by the UN IPCC. IPCC apparently now, who actually is not, by the way, a lot of this report, I know just about every authors in this report, in IPCC report, is selected by government, of course. If you ask yourself, how many solar physicists are represented in those reports? They actually apparently favor only these data sets now, they say, okay? Which is very strange, by the way. And the problem is that the people in solar physics don't come out and say nothing. Only one little Willy Soon always jumping up and down as if I'm so busy body. <laughs> but the problem is that this is very problematic. Because this, this kind of curve assumes that all the irradiance is caused only by changes in sunspot number. I kid you not, if you correlate that with sunspot number, this thing is almost 9.95%, I mean 99% or 95%, which is really crazy because you know why? If you really want to study physics about how this hot gaseous ball, how the magnetism is changing and how the, the heat gets dissipated and then the light output gets changes, it's a very complex thing. Like that kid was asking me, does it depend only on sunspot? Hell no! We know that for sure, so I know this is wrong by the way. This is why I would never use this to study science. I would use at least one of those, okay? And I'll just show you one example. By the way, don't want to go further. Please read the paper if you want to know a lot more insight. We have saved everything. Science, you cannot show only one side and don't show the other side. We show everything. You see the paper, please read it. Of course, I, I don't have too much more time to tell you more story about this. Very interesting, by the way. Next, please. So this is just to show you that uh, you know you got it for the northern hemisphere. Can you show similar thing for the rural USA? Yes, right? Not too bad, is that? Okay. The next thing is obviously that was just a statistical correlation, right? It would be really embarrassing, or else I'll be showing you graph like this, right? <laughs> According to the graph that is wrong, the NASA gives temperature, as you can imagine. I just plot the postage, uh, you know, thing changes. Things like that, right? It's ridiculous. It's joking aside. It's just trying to tell you that, you know, uh, uh, statistical correlation doesn't mean causation, right? It's only a statistics. It's just a very strange thing. Please don't use the word significant numbers. All that. We are nonsense, actually. I don't like those things too much. Don't give all those numbers. It's just give me a headache. So now, what is the real reason, right, that you have this uh, relationship? And I offer one simple way to look at this. Next. Which is to say that every time, if you have more incoming, incoming sunlight, okay, some of it will reach the surface ocean. It just evaporates more, created water vapor. What is water vapor? It's also a greenhouse gas, isn't it? As much as what CO2 is. In fact, if you read any textbook, CO2 is known as what you call minor greenhouse gas. H2O is what? Major greenhouse gas. Just simply say that the role is really different. Okay, if you want to quantify the number, it's complicated, but of course, relatively speaking, H2O, nobody wants to talk about, right? And they focus on this CO2 being the real driver coming out from Al Gore's breath. Thank you. Next. Al Gore doesn't like facts. So, from this paper, we did a few more things. You know, science is not about just all this stuff, and then try to see what can this correlation and all this interesting stuff imply in terms of how Let's say you ask a simple question, people still, no, no doubt that CO2 is some kind of a, what you call infrared active gas, which means it's sensitive to infrared radiation, okay? If you have more CO2, it will interact with the infrared radiation part of the planet Earth, no doubt about that. When we do this, we try to fit the data and try to see if it can give us some implications. So one of the, map, one of the things that we did was to see, to ask the question, what if we double the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? They call it climate sensitivity. Typically, IPCC is arguing that anything from 1.5 degree to about 6 degree, okay? And then with the best probable mean about 3, 3, 3 degree, 4 degree, things like that, Celsius, right? And what our result from this study shows that, next, it's only 0.4 degree Celsius, okay? At least that's our conclusion. If they don't like it, too bad, right? Challenges. And then I think one or two more slides, I'm done, next. Yeah, finally, I think probably the secret is that we are unable to tax the sun, right? If the sun has anything to do with this climate system, what a tragedy it is. 
Why are they so afraid to find out the truth? That's all I'm saying. Right? And remember, all this work are being published and stuff and so on and so forth. I can argue at length about which one should be preferred. I think the kids immediately have the instinct to ask the question, why you pick this one, why you don't pick that one, right? But I know for sure the one that favor IPCC is wrong. That's why I would never use them. Because I could not justify in my paper. It's embarrassing, right, to use that. Okay? Thank you. I think next will be microphone.